Good morning, everyone. Um, and for some people, I guess it's not morning. Uh, those who are uh, visiting us from Israel, it's uh, maybe evening time at this point. Uh, anyway, my name is Julie Galler. I am the Director of Institutional Advancement here at Shas, and we are very excited to have launched this Grandparents Association. And part of um, being a part of the Grandparents Association is that you get to learn with our uh, head of school, Rabbi Jordan Safer, which we're very, very excited about. Um, this is the first of three um, shiurim that we're going to be offering. The, the next one will be um, in February, I believe it's February 10th, and I will send you information about that. And um, we hope uh, at some point we're going to get to see you all in person in this building. Um, but until then, enjoy the the uh, Shavuot Veshas that we send out, the various pictures that we have on Smug Mug. If you have any questions about how to access uh, that, or like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, right? Follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, yes. Um, so that you get to see all the amazing things that are going on in our school. And I will turn it over now to Rabbi Safar. Thank you so much. I just had to kick Julie out of the office so that I could take my mask off as much as I'm sure you all wanted to watch me doing, teaching a class with my Let's Go Yankees mask on. Uh, you know, I, I decided it can, I know, I know how much you like it. Uh, so we, um, it's great to see everyone, even if we can't be together in person, I would say it's actually quite uh, one of the brachas, one of the hidden discoveries. Um, is our ability has actually expanded our definition of can't be physically together. And we've started saying there are plenty of times we can't be physically together. And can we use different platforms to get together, to learn together, uh, and to see each other? So it's, it's a um, before I jump in to be discussing today, just a quick show of hands. I guess it'll only work for those of you who are on camera. If you're not on camera, you could hit the like button if you know how to. Uh, would you prefer that, I don't know if people have the printed sheets or that you'd prefer I share my screen so that you could see the sheet. So I see some people holding up the sheets. Um, would other people prefer I share my screen? Just raise your hand if you prefer I share my screen. All right, so the majority easier than my last one, which was with the fifth graders when I told them that Ratatouille is the movie they're watching on their sleep under tomorrow night. Let's just say half the, the Star Wars fans in the room uh, started a little revolution. So hopefully there'll be no Zoom revolutions happening going on. Uh, and I will share my screen in just a minute once we jump into the sources to um, get going. This class I started developing a number of years ago uh, when I found an intriguing halachic question. And I, I want to frame this halachic question um, slight slightly. And what the framing I want to offer is that often people think of halacha purely ritualistically, right? When do I do this practice? How do I do this practice? If I wash my hands before I eat, how much bread do I need to eat in order to wash my hands? And how should I be washing my hands? That fits into our general expression of halacha very neatly. But halacha truly dictates far more than just that. Halacha is going to dictate how we're acting in everyday situations throughout different situations. And the halacha question that I am dealing with, that I'd like us to look into, um, is the halakhic question of expelling children. What happened was a number of years ago, we had a child at my old school who we had been supporting and we had been caring for and we really thought we were doing everything. Uh, and it was an open campus. If you can imagine, if you know the Shas campus, imagine it being about 10 times the size of Shas's campus in the middle of Greenwich, Connecticut with no fence. And on a Friday afternoon, this boy ran off campus. Um, it was raining. It was a, like a scene from a tragic movie. 
Uh, and I had been sitting making photocopies in the office. Thank God I spotted him and I, I ran off campus um, and he made it about a quarter of a mile away from campus before we were able to actually bring him back to safety. And we were really torn because we had spent about a year and a half since he had transferred into our school trying to set up a system to support him, to care for him, and to give him everything he needed. And here we were at a breaking point where we had to ask ourselves, can we do everything for this child? And it tore me up. As I mentioned, it was a Friday. I spent that entire Shabbos looking at the halakhic sources for it. And what I found was actually immensely empowering. And it flipped the conversation on its head. And instead of having a conversation of the halakhic limitations of when we can and can't expel a child, which we'll touch on, I came across sources of, that framed education as the savior of Judaism, the ultimate savior of Jewish practice. Now, I, I'm going to admit that I um, was debating between two sources, two source sheets, combined them, and gave the wrong name at the top of your, the source sheet you had, because that is from another source sheet that I was going to be doing. So Baba Ben Buta is a wild story. I'll tell you parenthetically that it is a story that involves, um, I don't know, I don't even want to go into it, murder, incest. Uh, decomposition in honey, that it's a story for another time. I, I promise it is a worthwhile one to tell that somehow also ends in Judaism being saved. This story is more PG. It is, it is our um, nice elementary school story, but equally empowering and uh, vital to understanding really um, Jewish education as it exists today. So no further ado, I'm going to share my screen and jump right in to the question um, that we are going to deal with, which is how did Jewish day school start and what does that mean for us today? Um, I don't have it open, so just give me one moment. I'll pull it open and um, we should be good to go. All right, thumbs up if you could see my see my screen now. All right, there we go. I got some thumbs up. Um, so the first source we're going to have, um, and again, many of these sources are just going to speak to how powerfully we view education. It, it, and I actually don't think I can overhype where it's going to go and how strongly it's going to say it. So it says in Masechet Shabbat, this is from a Babylonian Talmud, the Talmud Babli, Lo Charba Yerushalayim, Jerusalem wasn't destroyed, meaning the temple wasn't destroyed, Ella, except for, meaning the only reason Jerusalem was destroyed, because school children there were interrupted from studying Torah. What was the grave sin? Now, I'm sure if I at, opened it up, what have people heard? I will open it up. Someone can unmute yourself if you've heard a source for why the temple was destroyed. There's a, a, an answer, at least I was given as a child, that I thought was the only answer presented. I'm wondering if other people have heard different answers of what the grave sin of Jerusalem, of, of, of our people was that got Jerusalem to be destroyed. Yeah, Dahlia. Yeah, Dahlia, I can't hear you. You're I, unmuted, but I yeah. can't hear you. Okay. I'm not sure. Um, can you hear me now? I don't know what's going on. Other people can hear you? Oh. I'm sorry. Oh, 
we can hear you, yeah. I was at camp one year on Tisha B'Av. Uh, the temple was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam. We'll put it back together with acts of Tikkun Olam. That was our, our chant, right? It was destroyed because of baseless hate, because we treated each other poorly. We'll put it back together. You want to rebuild the temple? Start treating each other nicely. There is an amazing message in that, of course. And there's an amazing truth in that. But that answer is one of a list of answers. And this one is another one of that list, another on that line of is because we So egregious, so in the Mishnah, Yecholim Chanut Shebechatzer, Yecholim Chod Biyado Vilamarlo, Ini Yecholi Shen, Mikola Nichnesin, Mikola Yotzin. The question is if I uh, want to open up a store in my shared courtyard, can my neighbor protest? And the answer is yes, a neighbor can protest and say, You can't have a store where they're accessing their shared courtyard when I'm trying to sleep. That's just not fair. Um, then it's going to go into other examples. Aval Osek Halim, but what if I'm not actually having people come in and come in and out of my store? Instead, I am, it's a workshop. Can you tell me you can't sleep because I'm working in my workshop and making vessels? No. Yote Mokhe Betocha Hashem. I can take that. Be'eno Yacholim Chobiado. If I'm taking them, what I'm making, bringing it to the shuk, selling it there, you can't tell me not to do that. That's the privacy of my own home. I teach this Mishnah to our children here, our fourth and fifth graders here, and we often ask, uh, what is that line? For example, I'm allowed to have a barbecue in my backyard, and I'm allowed to make a bonfire in my backyard. Am I allowed to make a fire so big that the smoke makes it that you can't breathe next door? No, obviously I can't that. I can play music in my house, but I also can't play it so loudly that you can't sleep next door. That's the line that we're wrestling with here. And the, this Mishnah is framing it as if you have people coming into your house, your neighbor can stop you. But if you're bringing it out, then your neighbor can't stop you. Then you're, you're kosher, you're, you're covered. But they're going to present an exception. You also can't do it for the sound of school children. It doesn't present it as an exception, right? All it says is you can't say the loud, uh, the um, hammer's too loud. You can't say that the utensils are too loud. And you can't say the school children are too loud. Wh who said anything about school children? Where did that come from? They're just throwing it in casually, but it's actually a remarkable statement. You see, every other statement was about building something that you're going to take and bring outward. This final statement was bringing people into your home. It is an exception, and it's an exception we're going to allow for. And the story of how we allow for it is one of the few times that the Talmud uses the words that because of this person, Judaism was saved. In fact, uh, if people are familiar with um, the phrase uh, the Zal or Zachar Latov that you put after someone who is deceased, that's going to come from this story. That's, this story is our source because the person who we're referencing it is so important. Maishna Resha U Maishna Sefa. The Gemara is going to ask right away. What's the difference between these two cases? Why in the case of the um, store, am I allowed to stop him? But in the case of school children, I'm not allowed to stop him. They seem to be remarkably identical. I'm bringing people in for my business. It's getting really loud. Someone else can't sleep. But in one case, I could stop you. In the other case, I can't stop you. Sefa et an, Latino coach of Beit Rabban. Why? Because the Takana, the second part, is talking about the Takana, the teaching of Yoshua Ben Gamla. 
it references that this as something we should all know. We should all know who what this Takana of Yoshua ben Gamla is. The problem is, and I looked this up this morning, in fact, this is an amazing book that goes through all the rabbis of the of the Talmudic period. And if I open it to a random one, for example, you could see Nachum Ishkamzu, not even the most famous character, going to get two pages written on him. Uh, if I open up to Rabbi Akiva, by the way, it's like seven pages. So I would think if I open up to Yeshua ben Gamla, I'm going to have a lot of pages. But if you look closely, I get a paragraph, a paragraph on this Yeshua ben Gamla. And yet it's referencing it as if, hey, who doesn't know about the story of Yeshua ben Gamla? So what is that story? The Amar, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda, Amar Rav. So we have a legacy of Rabbi Yehuda teachers in the name of Yab. Beram zachur oto ha'ish latov Yoshua ben Gamla Shemo. We remember this person for good. We remember this person in the highest of heights. And Yoshua ben Gamla is, is his name. She'il malahu. If it were not for him, nishtakach Torah mi Israel. If it were not for him, Torah would have been lost from Israel. So I know I have the English in front of you, and if you're anything like me, you've probably finished reading through it while I'm talking. So my next question probably would, won't work. But for those who haven't, who haven't, who aren't, who aren't cheaters like me, looking ahead, would you guess? Can I? Anyone offer a guess of what this person could have done that's so remarkable that we say that if it were not for him, Torah would have been completely lost from Israel? We're thinking in terms of the Talmud. What would the Talmud say this person did so importantly that if it were not for him, Torah would be lost from Israel? It's hard to even imagine what the Talmud what what the Talmud would ascribe this for. The answer, spoiler, since you know, in, in class I'd wait in silence for about five minutes till answer someone someone answers. I won't put everyone under that same pressure uh, over over Zoom. Um, the answer is that he decentralized the education. He made education available to everyone. And what do I mean by that? Shabbat Chila, in the beginning, Mishi Yeshlo Av, Milam Totora, Mishi Ein Lo Av, Hayalame Torah. Someone who had a father, that father would teach him Torah. Great. You had a knowledgeable father, you became knowledgeable. That's wonderful. If you didn't, you didn't get to learn. That's fine too. You do your own thing. But think about that. What's amazing is that Torah really wouldn't have been forgotten in that model. At least it shouldn't have been. The expert fathers teach the expert children. And that strand, that legacy, that dynasty of Torah scholars exists. The rabbis say that if that dynastic model of Torah scholarship persisted, Torah would have been forgotten from Israel. What we need is everyone to have access to Torah. It's not good enough that if my father learned Torah, I'll learn Torah. We have to create a model where every single person has access to our scholarship. And he goes further. He goes further in what he's saying, just switching for the sake of time to English on this one. The Gemara explain, uh, he, they ex explains it through verses. Um, and I need a, I have all of you large, so I don't, I, I don't see what it's up to here. Um, I'll scroll down here. When the sages saw that not everyone was capable of teaching their children and Torah study was declining, they instituted an ordinance that teachers of children should be established in Jerusalem. All right. So step one was we see that you know, it's only this small group who's learning. Let's set up a yeshiva system in Yerushalayim, and it'll be great. People will come here, and the, actually the proof text here is exciting. It's Ki Metzion Torah, because from Jerusalem, Torah will come out. So we're going to set up this, this model of yeshivot in Yerushalayim. We'll send you there, and great. By the way, this is my parenthetical soapbox about one of the problems that American Judaism has today. 
we've somewhat stopped right there. We have somewhat stopped right there and said, you know, they'll have their gap year in Israel. When they go off to Israel, that's really when their in-depth learning and their in-depth connection, that'll really grow. And if I took a poll of parents at Shas, I know that a majority of them would cite their year in Israel. I'm personally, I had two years in Israel that I would cite as remarkably transformative. That's amazing. And we'll see somewhat problematic as well, because it means we're outsourcing. We're outsourcing a little. And what about the people who can't go to Israel? And, and, and the rabbis ask that. They say, but still, whoever had a father, his father ascended with him to Jerusalem and taught him. But whoever did not have a father, he didn't ascend. And therefore, they said that's problematic, right? Because then, okay, fine. If I have a non-learned, the first problem was only people with learned fathers would become learned themselves. We solved that. Now we're going to do it in Yerushalayim, have teachers. But now it's only people with parents. What if I have no way of getting to Yerushalayim? What if I have no one to take me there? What if I don't have the money? It's still not good enough, says the rabbis. The rabbis say that is still not good enough. Therefore, the sages instituted, reading again, ordinances that teachers of children should be established in one city in each and every region. And they brought the students there in the age of 16 or 17. So we've said at first, it's going to go father to son. That's too, that's too exclusive. Then we say, okay, so fathers, let's take them to Yerushalayim and you'll learn there. Still too exclusive. Okay, we're going to set it up in each and every school. By the time you're 16, 17, you'll be in these, these universities, these colleges we've created. And unsurprisingly, the Gemara, once again, is going to say, not good enough, insufficient. You're not doing enough. But as the students reading again, but as the students were old and had not yet had any formal education, a student who teacher grew angry at him, would rebel against him and leave. It was impossible to hold the youth there against their will. This state of affairs continued until Yoshua ben Gamla came and instituted an ordinance that teachers of children should be established in each and every province and in each and every town. And they would bring the children in to learn at the age of six, at the age of seven. What was the issue here? I thought the first time I read this, I assumed the problem would be, hey, 16, 17, too late. Some kids will have a head start. Some, that's part of the problem. But the problem here was actually teaching students how to learn. That we see that if you're not teaching them how to behave, how to be a learner from the time that they're young, six, seven, it's going to be impossible for them to be learners when they get older. We have to give them the skills as children that we want them to access as adults. That's what we're looking for. The Gemara is then, by the way, this is parenthetical. I keep it in here because I do think it's important and good to know. Going to go into the question of uh, hitting a child, right? And when you strike a child for educational purposes, hit him only with the strap of a sandal, which is small and does not cause pain. So on one hand, I would imagine many of our modern sensitive ears are saying, wait, the Gemara allows you to hit a child in education? But I do want to reframe it. Perhaps it's an apologetic. And if someone wants to accuse me of that, I think that's a fair accusation. But I think it's pretty remarkable that 2,000 years ago, they were already limiting touching a child for educational purposes. Because that's a message that in the 50s in this country, they hadn't heard yet. And yet 2,000 years ago, and you'll see Rashi, who's a little bit more modern, um, it is, it takes it even further, you'll see it is inappropriate to rebuke him more than necessary or remove him. Rather, he should stay amongst the others and eventually he'll pay attention. Rashi saying, don't even hit him, just have him be there. The positive energy will take him away. The final part that I want to look at together is that Rashi actually, in this piece, again, sneaks in a word that makes all the difference in the world in the word. I'm going to highlight it. Lo Basalko. You're not allowed to remove him. You're not allowed to remove 
the child. It went from don't hit him too much to don't even remove the child. And what the halachic sources are then going to become nervous about is when can I ever remove a child? Now, in the case I framed this conversation with, we did have to send him to a right school. We didn't have the services to keep him safe. We didn't have the services to make sure that he was looking after himself and others. But what this is begging us is to remember that you are giving them the greatest gift in the world. If we believe that Torah education is the secret, it's our toolbox, it's our treasure chest, then if you're going to take that away from somebody, it better be for a good reason, because this is our secret. When people ask, what is it that's special about Judaism? What is it that, why should I invest in a Jewish day school? Our answer is simple. Our answer is Torah education will lead you to a richer life. And if we truly believe that, which by, by the way, I believe with every fiber of my being, that a proper Torah education will give you the tools to experience a life of gratitude, a life of purpose, a life of meaning. It'll help you strive for more and more. Then we should never be taking that away from a child. And if we have to, it, it, it has to be with the heaviest of hearts. And scrolling down till the bottom here, Rav Moshe Feinstein was asked this question when he was the rabbi on the Lower East Side, new schools emerging. They said, can we expel a child if need be? And I just love his words. I love his words in the beginning with the question. Um, by the way, is, is what, how he frames it in the beginning. He says, as long as he's not ruining the experience for other learners, as long as that learner isn't ruining it, then you can't kick them out. And then he says, but what if they are ruining it for other learners or it's just not working for them? But if this student is really making it hard for other students, Vadai Tsari Lisalko. Obviously, you have to remove him. Okay, total frame him, total flip. I don't know if everyone picked that up. Rashi said you can't. He didn't give any caveat. caveat. Ramosha now says, obviously, you have to remove him. But even right here in Ramosha, the final words are pulling at our heartstrings. Aval, but, sarich ladun zeb bekavod rosh. But you have to consider this with utmost serious, iyun rab, with tremendous conversation, ki, why? Ki hu kedine nefasho, because this is at the level of murder. This is a conversation that is as serious as taking a life. Removing someone's child from an educational experience is as serious as removing life support from them. That's our level of devotion, of commitment to Torah education to children. So if we go back to the way beginning, this man, Yoshua ben Gamla, what did he do that was so remarkable that we say if it wasn't for him, Torah would have been destroyed from Israel? He brought education down to younger grades. That's it. All he did was say, let's open an elementary school in each and every province. Let's have an elementary school. That's not something wild. That's not something that we're looking at and saying, oh, that's the game changer we were all expecting. It seems so, so pashut, so simple, so nothing. Il malehu, if it weren't for him, Torah would have been lost from Israel. We wouldn't have had people who are getting it from a young age. I believe that at Shas, that's what our mission is. I, I, I've said that I wish Jewish day schools took on the name, the Yeshua Ben Gamla Day School, because that's what we are trying to say. We are trying to decentralize education, to make sure that we're giving it to every child, meeting them, Basher Husham, wherever they are, whatever needs they have. That's the power of modern education, of, uh, of progressive pedagogy. I read all these books about what is the progressive model? The progressive model is exactly what Yoshua ben Gamla preached to us 2,000 years ago. That if you're unable to meet every child's needs somehow, or if at the very least you're uncommitted, Torah will be forgotten from Israel. 
And let's not kid ourselves. When they say Torah will be forgotten, it's not just that we'll forget five books. It means that we will not have the ethical, moral fiber of a society worthy of continuing. That's why the temple will be destroyed. Because our moral fiber, our ethical promise is the ability to keep learning, to keep learning together and moving and growing. And that's what Yoshua ben Gamla brought to the Jewish people. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to questions, ideas, pushback, uh, thoughts, unmute you. You have the ability to unmute yourself. I have the ability to mute you, need be. Uh, for some of you, I might be able to unmute you. We'll, we'll see. Um, but I would love feedback, questions, conversation. If not, you'll hear me asking myself questions. Yeah, yeah, Dahlia. I have a, a point here. First of all, I want to say that um, for a lot of people all over the world, education stops in sixth grade. Um, you know, we sort of take it for granted here in the West that we have this kind of education. Um, you know, even in, in India, it's, it's, it's a very new thing, this whole idea of elementary school in places like that. Um, and, you know, to, it was very innovative at the time that, and, he, and also setting this age of, of age six is not to be belittled. Um, you know, we, first grade, that's when first grade starts. Uh, there must have been um, some, you know, real keen um, insights into that being the age when kids could really start to learn um, in a day and age when that was not, that was not something to take for granted. And also most people in the time when he lived um, had children so they could put them to work, work on the farm, milk the cows, do what they have to do to support the family. And, um, and learning stopped usually when you were about 11 or 12 years old, and that's when you worked full time. So, you know, you, you have to realize that um, those were core years because those are the years before you could be expected to, to work. And basically what Rabbi Gamla was saying is you can't put your kids to work until they've learned something. Right. And that it's not okay to put a six or seven year old like they do in India and like they do all over the world. But you can't put that little kid to work right away. You, you have to yeah. teach them something first. Amazing. And I, I think um, years ago, I, I tried to compare um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, to different things coming out of Pure K Avot. And what you'll find is that there is remarkable insight throughout it that we maybe I'm just speaking as an American, as someone educated in the American university system, think we're so innovative in discovering. But if, if we um, think about the line from Pierre K. Avo, who Hayao Mer, that he used to teach us that five years you start studying scripture. Oh, wow, that's decently similar to the five-year-olds that we start saying should be starting kindergarten and moving towards academics. At 10, studying Mishnah. Pretty impressive that the modern academic practice is that at 10 years old is when students should be studying more theoretical learning like Mishnah. 13, study the commandments. 15, studying Talmud. That's pretty close correlation to when we're saying to start studying high school. Um, and if you go through, the wisdom is there. It's actually pretty remarkable, the wisdom of, of child rearing. And perhaps the answer to that is they were deeply committed to making this work. They were saying, we're not going to lose this. And they had to find the best practice to make sure it was uh, continuing for, for years and years. Thank you, Dahlia. Anyone else? Any other comments? Hi, Rabbi. Hi. Uh, I apologize only just because every time... You know, when everybody talks, I, I apologize, but it's, it's usually coming from wherever you came from. So I, I grew up in Worcester, and Worcester did not have a good day school. Um, and now there's no community left in Worcester. Mm -hmm. And um, the reality that I, and that's why we moved to Boston, and that's why we worked as hard as we uh, could for Maimonides School, was because this was our investment in our children. And the, the sad part, uh, the good part in the 1990s is that it became in 
to build and have day schools and the other streams of Judaism also got very excited about it until they realized in the last 20 years that it is very expensive to educate a child and, uh, and very, very wealthy, wise businessmen, but not, not Yoshua Ben Gamla thinkers, realize that I oh, will spend money to cover their gap year or camp, Jew, Jewish camp, birthright. or birthright trips. And, and where you would say, we, we, we've solved them, we, we've paid our tax. Um, while that's uh, not, those are very good things. I never want to take away from them. They'll, they'll never replace a day school education, never. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we're, we're so happy that you're there at Shas and working so hard and our, our granddaughter comes home and uh, I, I do my benching now when I bench, <laughs> I put on the video of her singing <laughs> benching along with me. Uh, four years old to do benching is pretty good. Uh -huh. uh, but I just, just some, just thoughts about how critical day school education is, but it is very expensive. Great. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, I love that video, by the way. It's been sent to me three different by three different people. Um, I think your your my parents are here too. I think breaking their hearts because the day school in their town closed, and you could see the direct correlation to the struggling of the town there. Uh, at the end of the day, the question is, uh, what's worth it, right? What what is worth it in life? And no one can make that decision for anyone else. Uh, but what we can see is Yoshu Ben Gamla said, this is worth it for us to invest in. And what he probably did, it, if we're taking an honest, critical look at, at how he acted, he probably lowered the standard of learning. And there were probably purists who looked at him and said, you are lowering the standards. You are, Torah could be way purer. Torah could be way cleaner. Torah could be way better if you didn't just say everyone gets it. And what he said is, that's not Torah. That's some pure abstract idea, but Torah is what is received and lived by everyone. Mrs. Tversky always, always said that Maimonides School was not intended to develop Talmidei Chachamim. Mm. It was intended to develop um, capable uh, balabatim who could go out into the world and live a traditional life, and raise traditional families. It's an amazing idea. When, when Yeshiva Hadar, an egalitarian yeshiva, was opened, they said specifically, we don't want to be making rabbis because we don't need knowledgeable, non-Orthodox rabbis. We have so many of those. We need to be creating knowledgeable, non-Orthodox practicing Jews, which we would call the day school parents. And when the rabbis of Hadar said that, I, I leaned in. I said, yes, that right. that is what the Orthodox and the non-Orthodox world needs to hear is that where we really need to be investing our energy is in the Amcha, is in everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Libby and Sarit's mom. What you're talking about takes me back to years ago but when my uncle Joseph Kamenetsky was the head of Torah Masora and his life's mission was traveling all over America to set up Hebrew day schools. And he would mm. go to remote places. He, I remember, when my cousin was born, he missed the bris because he was in Texas and Dallas setting up a Hebrew day school, couldn't fly back in time. I mean, I'm talking my cousins in the 70s years ago, but that was his life's mission to set up Torah Masora Hebrew day schools throughout America. And there are still schools in existence where they're still maintaining the community so that the schools are still functioning and giving Jewish education to kids. Which it's amazing. It's amazing. And it's a huge commitment, huge kudos to them. And that's the message of what we have to be doing. Yeah, Dahlia. Well, I just wanted to say that one thing that you said really hit home um, with me was that we're sending our kids to a day school for to learn gratitude, a moral education, um, 
I, I think that that point is not emphasized enough as to why send your kid to a Jewish day school. People think they're sending their kids to the Jewish day school so they can learn brachot, they can, they can daven. Um, they can learn that from their parents, honestly. Um, they can. Um, but it's the social setting where you're um, with other children and you learn to share and you learn to be kind and you learn to give tzedakah and, and uh, you know, you visit nursing homes and I don't know, all, that's, all the stuff that they do with the kids in school where they're also learning, um, you know, the opposite of sinatina, to care about each other, ahavat Yisrael. And, um, and that is as important as whatever um, Judaic skills they're learning. Honestly, that's really what it's, what's unique is that bullying, for example, you know, having policies where, you know, bullying is just completely unacceptable. Right. Um, it, we don't teach our kids that you have to learn to be strong and punch somebody, um, you know, if they attack you. We learn that the group has to come in and help the kid that's being attacked. Um, and, and, and that that one kid isn't supposed to learn fighting skills so he can beat up the bully. So, We're yeah, supposed well, to stop the bully. You're right. I agree. I, I, um, I heard it beautifully, and I, I'm trying to think as I'm saying it who I heard it from because I want to give them credit, but it won't come to me now. So hope, hopefully whoever it is will accept the credit anonymously for what I think was an amazing insight. They said that the point of a day school education isn't to give you the skills to learn a page of Gamaro. You could get that skill whenever. You could get it later in life. The skill of a day school is how to look at any page of Gamara and see how it makes you a better human being. They said that is, that is the true skill. Okay, a technique of learning a thousand vocab words, how to grind your teeth, you could do that whenever. But how do I look at any passage and immediately say, where's God in this? How am I better because of this? That's the skill we're hoping to, to go for. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're so happy to have uh, four of our Chess's grandchildren at your school. They, they, first, they love school. To have them. They love being there. They just love the teachers. They love the environment. They're excited to be at school. You know, they just they just love it. And I will say, we have a lot of friends and first people we know here in Ohio, very involved in the Jewish community in their synagogues and the federation. But as one person said before, they stopped sending their kids. Let's say at sixth grade to school, they went for junior high school and high school to public school. And unfortunately, a lot of those kids end up dropping out from the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. They end up with uh, spouses who are, are not Jewish, they end up with grandchildren or children who are semi-Jewish or not Jewish. And the parents say, well, look, I, I was a member of the shul and I was on the PTO mm -hmm. and I was on this. And the sisterhood and I volunteer for all these organizations. And I, but it's so hard for the children to resist six years of being in a non-Jewish secular school then to go to college for another four years, let's say, it's 10 years of being in an environment that's not Jewish. Yeah. Not just not Jewish, but in unfortunately many colleges now, it's anti-Jewish. It's yeah. anti-religious, it's anti-Israel, it's anti-Zionist. It's it's not just supportive, yeah. it's it's against our values. And so if you have a kid who's picture at six sixth grade, they enter this environment. What's the chances ten years later? They're going to emerge from the, being the child you want them to be. So, so I want to say two things. Number one, I love what you said. I love your framing. Obviously, I agree. And when I choose to teach this, which is one of my favorite subjects to teach, I, I sometimes know I'm preaching to the choir or uh, I'm telling. But I do think the framing is so beautifully put that even if you buy in already, seeing how they thought about it years ago, uh, it's just amazing to me. It's so beautiful and empowering. Um, Rabbi? The, oh, excuse me, uh, sorry. Yeah, Risa, let me say one more quick thing and then I'll, I'll call, uh, go over to you. I, tonight I'm giving a, a talk with one of my, my friends, a colleague of mine in, actually he's, he's in Ohio, near, near where you are, but he's in Cleveland, about talking to children about God. And one of the subjects 
we're actually going to be discussing is what am I okay with in terms of my child's practice practice differing from my own, right? We, we, I don't know if that's a conversation that we've often, I haven't had long enough. So let's take extremes, for example, and it could be that these aren't even the extremes for anyone in here, but let's go on one hand, intermarriage. I chose not to intermarry. And if my child chooses to intermarry, that will feel like a slight against me. Okay, that's one side. On the other side, for me, mom and dad, don't tell my siblings I'm going to say this, but I choose to be a Yankee fan. If my child chooses to be a Red Sox fan, I won't actually take that as a slight against me. It might be a fun way for me to jab with them, but there will be no ethical dilemma of me going to their wedding, of me naming their children. In fact, it won't be anything other than a giggle here, here or there. But what about the gray in between? I want my child to keep kosher. Well, what if they don't, but they have deeply ethical eating practices? Am I okay with that? I want my child to send their kids to day school. They chose not to, but they're investing heavily in other forms of Jewish education. Am I okay with, with that? And until we're able to articulate actually where I'm comfortable with my child deflecting from my own personal practice or belief, we won't have a clear way of knowing what we should be giving them in childhood, what messages we should be giving them in childhood. Am I giving my child the message, it's my way or the highway? By the way, if I do that with everything, the one thing I can guarantee is they will deflect because they're gonna deflect on at least something. And if everything is undeflectable, if everything is totally sacred, my way, well, then we're gonna be at a loss. But we have to figure out where am I comfortable saying they can practice differently? And maybe even beyond that, where do I hope they help me grow? Where do I hope they help bring my practice to a different place or a better place? All right, Risa, sorry about that. All I wanted to say is that I have been the admissions director at a day school in my community for the last 20 years, a tier of school. And I have to say that the difference between a child who comes into school, let's say a child who transfers in in the second grade, third grade, fourth grade, whatever it is, the difference between that child when they come in in September and how they are even just a few months later is remarkable. They are, because of the love that they get from the, the, the Rebbies and the Moras that you don't get in a public school, it opens their hearts, it opens their souls, it lets them be different people. And it's just the most beautiful experience. Um, and and it, if nothing else, the day schools give that to a child, it's like a gift. But day schools give more things to a child. A yeah. day school is not just a gift that a parent gives to their child. It's a gift that a parent gives to their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and the generations going forward. Because when you put a child in day school, you're less likely to lose them, as you were talking about, and have them go yeah, It's a gift you're giving to the Jewish people, right? Yes, it's just, it's absolutely a gift. It's a beautiful thing. And, and, um, the work that you all do in the day schools um, is just, it's a blessing from God that, that you're all blessed and you, it's just a beautiful thing. So I, I just I, wanted I, to, to say that I've seen the growth and the changes myself and it's incredible. So thank you. Thank you to all of you for these comments. Dad, I'll get to you in one second. One, one piece I wanted to say there is um, Rabbi, Rabbi Heshi Weeder is a teacher I never had. I never had him. He taught different grades. And yet he had me over his house for like five years for a perm suda. That was the most fun he had. He, he, we, I was at a conservative day school right outside of Muncie. So we sometimes had different teachers. He had like 12 kids running around his, his house. And yet he invited all of us into his home for his perm suda. He, he did trivia and he had fun. And that's the effect, right? I never had him for a single class. And yet he can have such a profound impact. All right, Dad. Well, it's actually your mom. Oh, mom. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I heard him. I just know that the day school education, it would cost a fortune. It required certain sacrifices. And it was the best gift we ever gave any of our kids. 
your proof of that. Yeah. But I just wanted to go back to something where the um, traditional learning would begin at the age of five or six. I think that also entitles us not to give that traditional learning before that, to let kids explore the world and to stay away from all that learning that so many people are pushing now. You know, that's my. I do, but I think you're, I think you are reading the source 100% accurately. That that is exactly what it's saying. It's saying, don't think you're firmer than the rabbis of the Talmud. Don't think you're, you need a, my child at three needs to be able to read Mishnah. They don't, right? And if you're forcing it on your child at that age, they won't be doing it when they're 10, which is why we're saying, wait, wait till they're, they're 10. They have to learn to play the, what happens before five or six. Actually, I think it's interesting that the Talmud refers to them as Tino Coat almost exclusively at that age as babies, right? And so we, we, those of us who have kids in that age bracket say, they're not babies. They're, they are. That's when they should be developing purely social, emotionally, purely through play, learning those different skills. Don't, they're going to learn. They're going to learn Mishnah later. They're going to even the deepest scholars. Don't. I uh, heard this great story. Maybe I'll close with this, invite everyone to leave. And if anyone wants to stay, I have a couple of minutes I could stay on. But I heard a story um, uh, about Ravavagya Yosef. So Ravavagya Yosef is generally considered, if not the greatest, one of the greatest scholars of our lifetime. He um, passed away uh, probably four or five years ago at this point. And when he passed away, stories were made, um, emerging of, of his greatness. One in particular, again, parenthetical, but it's a great story, was that when he was 15, um, his dad was not a wealthy man, said, I'm sorry, Vagya, you're, you got to come to work today. And so he went to his dad's shop and he worked the day at his dad's shop and everything was fine. And the next day he showed up at his dad's shop at 6 a.m. and the Rosh Hashiva was standing there with an apron on, ready to work. And they said, what, what are you doing here? And he said, I will work before we let Ovagya work. This man's going to be such a big scholar. Uh, let, let, uh, let me work before he works. That's the immensity of his scholarship. But and so I don't mean in, with this story to take anything away from that. Um, but someone shared a story that when he, by the time he was 10 years old, he had studied the entire Talmud. He knew the entire Talmud. And my rabbi, when I was learning in Israel, said, 10 years old, he studied the laws of Nida, and he understood them, the laws, that's what he was learning, he knew as a 10-year-old, right? And so the idea isn't he shouldn't be learning so much, it's could he really understand that question as an eight-year-old? Sure, he could get through those pages and his, the breadth of his knowledge. He forgot on a day, in, in a day, what he forgot is more than what I'll learn in a lifetime. And perhaps we also need to remember how you learn and how you give it to every child. And the model for Ovagi Yosef shouldn't be the model for every child. What we should be doing is supporting them, supporting their um, social emotional learning, supporting their cultural engagement, and using Torah always as our greatest tool to empower them to a life of gratitude, of kindness, of awareness, and of deep love for God, Torah, and the land of Israel. I would say if we are doing that, if they can open up the Torah and always see, wow, here's where I'm grateful. Wow, here's where I now see the world in a new light. Here's my connection to my people. Here's my connection to my land then we're doing something special. And, uh, and I'm confident that that will never go away. With that, I will thank everybody. We're going to have another one of these. Julie can remind me when it is. Um, that one likely won't be on education, so I apologize. Maybe it will be. We'll see. In advance, I'll send out the source sheets, and I'll look forward to learning with everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. I just want to say how grateful I am, Rabbi Stoffer, that you were the principal of my grandchildren's. Um, school and that um, you're really an extraordinary educator. That's and humbling. We're really, really lucky to have you. And I'm glad to hear that this year with the COVID crisis, not only didn't you lose students, but you gained some, I understand. Yeah, thank God. Uh, we are up, up 13 students from last year. 
Yeah, yeah. So that, that's really uh, a testimony to um, your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. It's the teachers mostly, but I'll take some credit and say thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye. Thank you.